Morning, brothers and sisters. Good to see you all again. Let us prepare our heart by singing Son uh, Hymn 262, Joy to the World. Good morning, everyone. What a privilege to worship the Lord freely together without any restriction in this special morning. On behalf of the session, we extend a very friendly welcome to you all in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, especially to our visitors. I hope you feel at home and truly blessed uh, during your time with us. Also, as we will have a time of fellowship after this service, please stay behind and have a cup of tea and coffee and some snacks for free. Uh, we have some announcements as well today. Uh, there will be no Sunday schools for three Sundays from today due to the school's term break. And there will be resumed from 5th of May, uh, the first Sunday, Sunday in May. And there will be uh, elders and deacons meeting tomorrow night. So please pray for the Lord's wisdom and guidance for the meeting. And as various fellowship groups will meet this week, uh, kindly take a look at the church bulletin for the details. And if you belong, uh, no, belong to no fellowship group yet, then please uh, talk to one of the elders so that uh, you may also uh, enjoy and share our brothers and sisters' uh, love and care physically and spiritually as well. Uh, we will have men's breakfast here in North Shore. <clears throat> at 7, 7, 7 o'clock in the morning on 27th April. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, on the last Saturday of uh, this month, April. So all men are more than welcome to this uh, delicious breakfast fellowship. And let's our God-given talent shine by getting ready for our annual church uh, talent showcase in the foremost in August. 
We welcome all kinds of performance, including skits, poetry, singing, bands, choirs. Also join uh, our art exhib exhibition with your paintings, photos, Lego crafts, even culinary creations. So more details will follow as we get closer to August. Uh, there are more announcements in, in the bulletin, so please have a look at, look at it uh, for the rest of them. Uh, and thank you very much, uh, Brother Don Petcher, uh, for taking the service this morning. And for your information, Daniel is at uh, Manga Karamiya uh, to lead the service there this morning. And our call to worship today comes from uh, Psalm 22, verse 1 and 2. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. As we prepare to worship the Lord, uh, let's make, take a moment of silent individual prayer. Uh, now, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your steadfast love and faithfulness in our lives. It is because of your loving kindness, care, and protection that we are here. Thank you because of gathering us here today for this service. We call on you to guide this service. Accept all our sacrifices, worship, praise, and prayer. Forgive our sins so that we are acceptable before your presence. Allow your Holy Spirit to be in our hearts, as we start the service this morning, may you be glorified from the beginning to the end. Please give us your peace so that we may be able to listen to you. While our brother Don is leading this service, please grant him your strength and wisdom to deliver your holy word with confidence and boldness. May you also please bless us, build us in our faith by opening our eyes, ears, and hearts so that we may truly Look and listen to your life-changing word. We pray all this in our Lord uh, and only Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Congregation, would you please stand? In verse 1 of Psalm 122, David says, <clears throat> I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. May we come with joyful gladness in our hearts as we come to worship our Lord this morning. And as we do, so we come to worship our Lord this morning, we may proclaim the words of the seraphim. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And the whole earth is full of his glory. And the Lord greets us this, with these words, grace and peace to you. From God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us commence our worship then by singing number 420, Onward Christian Soldiers, number 420.
seated. For our confessional reading, I would like to read um, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and that's on page 1140 in the Pew Bible. Uh, 1140 in the Pew Bible. Before we do that, I would like to just read a few verses from Matthew 22, verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And some of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So Jesus said, you shall love the Lord as you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now love's a big word. And so we'll turn then to 1 Corinthians 13 and see Paul's explanation of what it means to love. And we see in this section there are two aspects. There's the positive, the things that we are to do in loving, and the things that are not loving that we are not to do. So starting then, we'll read the whole chapter, starting in verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish, childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Amen. Let us come now to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Our gracious God, our Father in heaven, may we bless and praise your holy name. And we thank you, Lord, that we can come and worship you here this morning. Blessed be your holy name. And Lord, as we have read your commandments, we are to love you with all our heart, with all our strength, with all our mind. And we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. And as we have read Paul's explanation, Lord, we pray that you would forgive us when we have not shown the love that you call us to show, or for when we have done unloving things. Lord, may you forgive us our sins. May you cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that we might walk in your ways, that we might serve and worship you. 
that we will show our love to you and our love to our neighbours. Lord, blessed be your name. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. We'll continue our worship by singing number 216, In Christ Alone, number 216. We'll stand and sing. Now come to our congregational prayer and um, those watching on the live stream, it will be uh, muted and um, there's some items there that you perhaps could pray for, please.
I'd like to read uh, the first of uh, one of our readings, and that's um, uh, Psalm 2. We'll read the whole psalm. Psalm 2, and that's on page 528 in the um, Church Bibles. Psalm 2, and we'll read the whole psalm. <coughs> Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath. And terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the end of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron, and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. We we'll come now to the Lord with our offerings and our tithes, and one of the deacons will do that now. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you. We know everything that we have comes from you. And Lord, we are thankful. We hear a lot of news out there. Brothers and sisters and people are struggling and they still keep their faith. We give thanks and we humble by their faith. Lord, we thank you for your abundant blessing in our lives. As we offer our gift, may our faith be strained, knowing that you are the ultimate provider. And Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters who are engaged in the missionary work out there. We thank you for their faithful service, and may their faith and work inspire us. We pray for their continued guidance and provision for them. And Heavenly Father, we also pray for the members of the Hibiscus Coast Church. We're asking for your guidance and provision for them. We also ask you, uh, we pray that you will raise up more elders and deacons from among us, and maybe more brothers will be willing to step forward to serve. Lord, we pray also for our deacons as they extend your love, your care, and your support for those in need within our church and communities. 
and may the effort will reflect your compassion. We trust in your goodness and the care. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. We'll continue our worship by singing number 391, The Church's One Foundation, 391. We will stand and sing. Our first scripture reading is uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 2, and we'll read the first 18 verses. So Matthew chapter 2, and that's on page 960 in the Pew Bible, Matthew chapter 2. <clears throat> and before we read it, I'll just read a verse from um, uh, Romans 4, uh, 15 verse 4, which says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So as we come to read the word, uh, let us first of all uh, pray to the Lord. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for your word, the word that has been written, 
the word that has been handed down to us through the generations. And Lord, we thank you that we have it here today. And we have it in our own language that we can read it and understand it. So Lord, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word and the explanation and preaching of it. May it be done to the glory and honour of your name. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Matthew chapter 2, the first uh, 18 verses. <clears throat> now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it arose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, so it is written by the prophet, O you, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord has spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. <clears throat> then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. And then our second reading is Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, and that's page 1226 in the Pew Bible, 1226 in the Pew Bible. Revelation chapter 12. We'll read the whole chapter. The text is actually the first six verses, verses 1 to 6, but we'll read the whole chapter. <coughs> Revelation 12, starting then at verse 1. And a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. 
Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his heads seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth so that when she bore her child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child, one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1,260 days. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth, and see, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given the two wings of the great eagle, so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness, to the place where she is to be nourished for a time, a times and half a time. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with the flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand of the sea. The title of the sermon is She Gave Birth to a Son. And so sometimes it's referred to, or the text is used, as an Advent sermon. But the title could also simply be, God's plan is fulfilled. God's plan is fulfilled. The movie trilogy, The Lord of the Rings, produced by Peter Jackson, has been enormously popular and has certainly promoted our beautiful country of New Zealand. Peter Jackson has followed those three movies, read two more based on Tolkien's book, The Hobbit, which was written as an introduction to The Lord of the Rings. The first movie was called An Unexpected Journey, and the second one is called The Desolation of Smog. Part of the popularity of these movies is that they deal with big themes that everyone can identify with, especially the conflict between good and evil. These books and movies portray the good wizard Gandalf fighting the evil wizard Saruman, the good hobbit Bilbo fighting against the depraved Gollum. These are stories of light versus darkness. The riders of Rohan versus the orc army. Righteousness versus injustice. Tolkien was a Christian, and like his friend C.S. Lewis, 
right out of a Christian worldview with a biblical perspective. The Bible describes a conflict between good and evil, between light and darkness, between God and Satan, between Christ and the devil. This last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, gives us an overview of this conflict, but it assures us that Christ and his church will be victorious over the devil and his evil angels. The book of Revelation was written to encourage Christians who were suffering persecution in the first century in the Roman Empire. They could take heart knowing that God was in control of the entire world and that Jesus Christ was king. Revelation 12 gives us a bird's eye view of this conflict, taking in the whole history of the world and of this struggle. It provides us with an overview of the people of Israel in the Old Testament, the birth of Jesus Christ into this world, and of Satan's attempts to to destroy this newborn child. This chapter is a dramatic, powerful retelling of the birth of Jesus Christ. In verses 1 to 6, which is our um, sermon text, describes the conflict between God and Satan. Verses 7 to 12 focus on the spiritual battle going on at the same time between Satan and the archangel Michael. Verses 13 to 17 describe the attack of Satan on the church in this present age. So today we are only looking at verses 1 to 6 that describe this conflict between Satan and Christ. And we're going to consider it, firstly, the characters, and then secondly, um, those involved in this conflict, and they are engaged in. So firstly, there are four characters mentioned here. There are four characters mentioned here. The first one is the woman. She is a picture of the people of Israel, the Old Testament people of God, and she is clothed with the sun. A picture of the glory of Israel. She has the moon under her feet. A picture of her power and rule. And a crown of 12 stars on her head. A description of the 12 tribes of Israel. People in the world often despise the church and look down on her. To them, the church seems to be weak and feeble. Irrelevant and insignificant. And we can think of the line in verse 3 of the hymn that we sang before, where it says, Though for, with a scornful wonder men see her sore oppressed. Unbelievers often look at the church with scorn. Even Christians can get discouraged about the church, especially when there are problems and arguments. When Christians bicker amongst themselves and pick on each other, when members are ungrateful, and ungodly. But we need to see the church as God sees her. The church is the bride of Christ. She is beautiful and splendid, grand and glorious. And as we sang in verse 1 of that hymn, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. And we also read that the woman was pregnant. Some of the women here could tell us stories about the joys and struggles of their pregnancies. We've had a few recently, and, um, and they've all gone well, we thank the Lord. The Old Testament is the account of the pregnancy of Israel as she prepared to give birth to the Messiah. A woman's pregnancy usually lasts about 40 weeks, give or take a few weeks, The pregnancy of Israel lasted 2,000 years. It began when the Lord enabled Sarah to conceive in her old age. And she gave birth to a son whom she named Isaac. The pregnancy of Israel continued from one generation to the next, following the line of Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, all the way through to Joseph and Mary, 
who were from the tribe of Judah, who were from the house of David. We read in Luke chapter 2. Secondly, the woman was about to give birth, which introduces the second character in this drama, and that is the child. The child is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. The prophets spoke about him as the star of David, the Lion of Judah, the Righteous Branch, the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace. He would be a prophet like Moses, a priest like Melchizedek, a king like David. He would fulfill all the ceremonies, rituals and sacrifices that were carried out in the temple services. He would complete all the feasts and festivals that Israel celebrated. He would fulfill the law of Moses perfectly because he was the son of God able to keep the entire law down to its last detail. The Apostle John did not mention the birth of Jesus in his gospel, but in this book of Revelation, he gives us an account of Christ's birth in quite a different narrative than what we read in Matthew and Luke's gospel. The third character in this drama is the dragon. Dragons were described in the mythology of the ancient peoples. The Canaanites wrote about a leviathan and the Egyptians about a crocodile. For his description of smog, Tolkien drew on these myths and on the old English poem Beowulf, which had a dragon at the heart of the story. One of the reviews of this Hobbit movie describes Smorg as one of the great dragons of world cinema. He is a giant, flying, fire-breathing combination of serpent and crocodile. But as terrifying as Smorg is, the enormous red dragon described here in Revelation is even more terrible and horrible to look at. He has seven heads, which are terrifying in itself, but may also suggest that he was hard to kill. If you cut off one head, there are six others to go. And he has ten horns. A horn is a symbol of power, and this dragon has ten of them, so he is very powerful. And he has seven crowns on his heads. A crown is a symbol of political authority. The dragon has seven, symbolizing his widespread rule, over the nations. This enormous red dragon represents Satan, who is described in more detail in verse 9, where we see that ancient serpent, the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. The reference in verse 4 to a third of the stars probably looks back to the fall of Satan how he became proud and rebelled against God and took a third of the angels with him. This graphic description of his power warns us that we should never underestimate Satan. We need to take him seriously. Be on your guard because he goes around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Put on the full armour of God for your spiritual protection. Just as Bilba had his short sword, Sting, made by the high elves of the West, so you need to take up the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, written by the Holy Spirit. Thinking about the power of Satan should not make us despair, because we must also see the other person in the story, the fourth person, and that is God himself. The whole Bible is about God from the opening verse of Genesis. In fact, from verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right through to the closing verses of Revelation. The entire book of Revelation is written to show us that God is almighty and powerful and in control of all things that happen. 
So these are the four main characters described in this dramatic account. The woman Israel, the child who is Jesus, the dragon who is Satan, and God himself. Secondly, then, we turn to the conflict described here. Verse 4 describes the dragon standing in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. The Old Testament is the record of God working out his plan of salvation and the record of Satan seeking to thwart God's plan. This conflict was introduced in Genesis 3 when God spoke to that serpent Satan saying, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Genesis 3 verse 15. All through the Old Covenant, Satan tried to destroy the people of Israel, the royal line, and so destroy the Messiah. Starting with Cain, killing Abel. Then Seth is born. Then Satan sought to do what? Do that through Pharaoh in Egypt, who commanded all the baby boys of Israel to be thrown into the Nile. Through to the wicked queen Athaliah in the time of Joash, who tried to kill the entire royal family through the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and through Haman in the days of Esther, who tried to wipe out the Jews. Each time Satan thinks he's on the point of success to have the angel of the Lord step in and protect the royal line. Then the New Testament describes the birth of the Messiah. Eventually Israel gave birth to a son, a male child that we read in verse 5. When Jesus was born, Satan tried to devour him through the mad cruelty and paranoia of King Herod and his murder of all the babies in Bethlehem. But God the Father protected him by warning Joseph and having him flee to Egypt with Mary and Jesus. Satan attacked Jesus again at the beginning of his ministry with three temptations at the end of Jesus' 40 days in the wilderness. During the ministry of Jesus, Satan tried to destroy Jesus through the malice and scheming of the scribes and Pharisees, who plotted to kill him. And eventually they did kill him, collaborating with Pilate and the Romans. But by then, that was in part of God's plan. But in this vision, John does not mention the ministry of Jesus, nor even his death and resurrection. He only mentions the fact of the birth and ascension of Jesus. Verse 5 says, She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. This is Christ's ascension. This chapter, chapter 12, is concentrating on one point, that God is all-powerful and that Christ is the victorious ruler. The focus is not on Christ's humanity, but on his divinity, and so on his kingship, power, and glory. He will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And this is a quote from Psalm 2, which describes the powerful rule and reign of Jesus, who is putting all his enemies under his feet. God not only rescued his son, but he also protected his New Testament people, the Church of Christ, his body. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, in verse 6. When the people of Israel escaped out of Egypt, they fled into the desert where they were safe. In the same way, the Church of Jesus in the New Testament is protected and kept safe. God has placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the Church, which is his body. The Church is safe for 1,260 days, a period also described, as we read in Revelation 12, as 42 months and as a time... Times and, 
and half a time. And there's a thousand years in Revelation 20. This describes the period from Christ's first coming until just before his second coming. This entire New Testament age in which we are now living. Throughout this time, Satan is waging war against the church. During the last 20 centuries, millions of Christians have died as a result of persecution. Many are being persecuted today, especially in Islamic countries. But Satan cannot prevent the church from growing, nor can he prevent the gospel from being preached. This will continue all through this gospel age. Jesus will go on extending his kingdom until he comes again. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority and power. This is the big picture of Revelation 12, of the conflict between good and evil, righteousness versus injustice, God triumphing over Satan, Christ victorious over the devil. This is the good news we can hear again and again. Christ is victorious. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, you are the sovereign Lord. You are the creator of the heavens and the earth. And all things work together for your good and according to your plan. Thank you that we can receive assurance from you that Satan has been defeated. He has no power. And then we can rest in the assurance of knowing your blessing. We thank you that the church is growing and will continue to do so through this gospel age. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. We we'll conclude our worship by singing number 327, Christ Shall Have Dominion. Number 327.
Out of the benediction, we'll sing number 530 as our doxology. Receive now the blessing of the Lord. O Lord, bless us and keep us. O Lord, make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. O Lord, turn your face towards us and give us peace. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Number 530.